All right. Well, here we go. We're just about done with James. Can I hear a good heavy sigh of relief from everybody? <laughs> no, it's been good. Uh, we do have a few studies left. I know I've slowed way down, but gosh, this stuff is so rich. I hate to not do it justice by spending some time on it. So we are going to look again at three verses tonight, uh, verses 10, 11, and 12 of James chapter 5. But we are in that final chapter, sort of that final section as well, which really started last week in verse 7, where we looked at uh, James talking about our real faith producing genuine patience. And I know when we hear that word already, sometimes it can make the little hairs on the back of your neck stand up. Really? Patience? But uh, it is indeed what he calls us to time and time again. And we'll see it again tonight as we uh, look at these verses. But really, um, throughout the whole book, we've looked at the things that our faith, if, they had, if it really is genuine, if we really are leaning on the Lord, if we are trusting in Him for everything, walking in His ways, then there is incredible stuff waiting for us. And James, of course has such a heart for the believers and especially for his own countrymen, the Jewish Christians that had been spread out and scattered throughout the world pretty much. And his desire for them to walk right and to do right and to walk in the ways of the Lord. And so he really gets very uh, bold and <laughs> as we've discovered many times uh, quite in your face with his exhortations and with his encouragements, but as we've learned, it's sometimes good to be that direct, isn't it? Uh, when it comes to the things of the Lord, I don't think anyone wants to really beat around the bush. I think we would rather hear very directly from God those things that he would want us to do. And the Lord certainly used James, the apostle, the half-brother of Jesus, to that end. So we've looked at our genuine faith producing stability and also producing genuine love, as we saw in chapter 2 through chapter, part of chapter 3. And then our real faith producing genuine humility through chapter 3 and now into chapter 5. And then finally, this last section, our real faith producing patience. And last week we started with that first part of it, that uh, James called us to therefore be patient, brethren, until the coming of the Lord. And the reason he was laying that out, as we discovered last week, to those young believers is that many of them were suffering persecution, especially under the hands of the rich, those that were over them that were more uh, well-to-do and had the means by which to regulate their lives, whether they were employers or um, um, leaders in government. But the wealthy, the powerful, the rich, and of course James had a few things to say to them, all of that stuff that you're storing up is going to corrode and corrupt and is not going to do you any good when the coming of the Lord is at hand. And all of the luxury and pleasure that you have um, is not going to hold up in the light of Jesus' evaluation of your life. So what you need to do is turn to Christ. And so in encouragement to those that were the victims of that persecution, James wanted to say, you know... I can't promise you that any of this will stop. And I find that interesting. Rather, you know, than saying, I, James so easily could have said, you know, just, just have enough faith and press into Jesus, and I'm guaranteeing that a lot of this stuff will, will just cease. He doesn't say that at all. As a matter of fact, he says, in the midst of these trials, in the midst of this persecution, when someone has wronged you, the best thing for you to do is to be patient because... The coming of the Lord. Wait until then. It's, it's right around the corner. And we saw last week that he used this example of the farmer who waits for the precious fruit of the earth, waiting patiently for it. Not only for the fruit of the earth itself, but for that which helps produce it, and that's the rain, the early and the latter rains that come through the season. And we, we looked at how farmers are so dependent, especially in, in Jesus' day, and especially in the biblical times, that God was the one that sent the rain. And, you know, they didn't have the advantage of irrigation, although we are discovering now in our state, especially, I don't know if you've traveled in the Central Valley lately or the central part of the state even, uh, it's, it's, a, it's dry up there. 
and uh, a lot of the farmland is is uh, getting kind of uh, crusty. So uh, even there, where they can funnel the water and tap into it and irrigate, uh, there's just not enough water, and they're having to cut way back. So even the farmers of our day are experiencing that uh, when there's drought, when the rains are withheld, there becomes a great dependency on God. And we looked at these peculiar and unique individuals that are farmers that are so patient because they put these seeds into the ground and then wait for them to sprout. And it's really kind of a quirky thing because you don't get instant gratification when you're a farmer. There's a lot of waiting. There's a lot of willingness to persevere and to go out and, and cultivate and pull out the weeds and keep everything up and proper and keep the soil most moist and, and turned. And yet, a long time before you even see the little green or whatever sprout breaking through those clods of dirt and then finally some kind of plant, whether it's corn or other vegetables that you've put there or uh, whatever it is that you're growing. And even fruit trees, we said, that takes even longer. But such a peculiar lot. You know, kind of like that old farmer that was pretty well retired, but he still worked his farm, and he was walking down his dusty road one day off to the pond that was there in the back end of his property, and he looked down and he saw a frog. So he picked up the little frog and looked at him, was about ready to put it in his pocket, and all of a sudden the frog says, Hey, if you give me a kiss on the lips, I'll turn into a beautiful farmer's wife. And he kind of looked at the frog and started putting it back in his pocket. And the frog said, hey, didn't you hear what I said? And the farmer said, yeah, but at my age, I'd rather have a talking frog. <laughs> what can I do with a wife? I, I, I'm way past that. So I was now a pocket frog, I guess. Farmers, they're a great example. The way that they wait so patiently. And James, of course, encouraging that we too would be patient and strengthen our hearts because the coming of the Lord is at hand. And then we ended last week with that encouragement that we shouldn't grumble against one another, that we shouldn't have those times where we just allow the situations around us to so get under our skin. And in the case of these guys, the persecution they were enduring, that they started lashing out at each other. Because very often, as we've talked about before in this book, that seems to be the status quo, doesn't it? When outside pressures come in, our tendency is to nip and bite at each other. That it's, that it's within, rather than, than holding each other up, rather than linking shields and, and strengthening ourselves within the group so that we can face the opposition that's outside, we turn on each other. And so James strongly said, Do not grumble against one another, brother, unless you be condemned. Behold, the judge is standing at the door. That time of judgment is right there. It's God's hand is on the handle. He, he's ready to turn the knob and open the door to that final judgment. And of course, James's view was that that would be very soon. And how much sooner is it for us, some 2,000 years later, as God so patiently has worked with humanity to see that more and more and more would be saved and be able to uh, line up the streets of heaven with praise and with adoration for him. So that brings us to where we are tonight. And James is now going to continue this encouragement to be patient while we wait for the coming of the Lord. And he wants to give two more examples of how to be able to suffer with patience. And it is one thing to have patience when everything's great, isn't it? Oh, I can wait for that. Even sometimes we're willing to wait for good stuff. Not usually, you know. If you've made up your mind that you're going to buy that new car, uh, it's, it's really tough to put that off for a month, isn't it? I mean, all the finances are in place and everything seems right, and the one you're driving right now is about ready to fall out from under you. Every time you start it, you know, it, it definitely improves your, your prayer life. Oh, Lord, please let this work. And you're just, you've determined now it's time. And oh, goodness, it's all you can think about, huh? And you've looked around already. And maybe you've picked just that right model and off you go. And so we don't even necessarily have a lot of patience when things are great. But certainly when we're suffering, when we have those times in our lives when things don't necessarily add up, they may not completely match up. We've got those questions, you know, okay, Lord, what, what are you doing here in my life? What 
purpose does this particular time of trial or even suffering have to do with my walk with you? What are you trying to refine in me? And there isn't always an answer. We're, we're going to look at a very good example of that tonight a little bit later on. But what James is saying is, that we need to be willing to have that kind of patience when we suffer, especially when we've been wronged. When those trials come and it's something that's out of our control and we can see the Lord's hand in it, that's one thing. But what about when people around us have wronged us in some way? And really, we don't care much if they're believers or not, do we? We hold the same standard. We've been wronged. The record needs to be set straight here. There, there needs to be some kind of payment for all of this. Vengeance is mine, says me. <laughs> and yet we realize that God doesn't call us to a life of being vindictive, but rather a life of peace and a life where we would bless those who curse us and wrongfully use us and persecute us. But see, our sinful nature naturally quarrels even with God when we go through hard times. Right? I, I know that your prayer life probably improves when there's situations in your, in your life that are adverse. But um, I guess I would challenge all of us, yeah, our prayer life improves, but what kind of prayers are we praying? Are they, are they requests of God and adoration to Him, or are we arguing with Him? Lord, why? Have you, got, <laughs> you really know what you're doing here, Lord? Because this doesn't make sense to me. This isn't falling into place. I mean, when there's that loss of job or maybe that professional disappointment, you didn't get the promotion that you thought you should have or, or a marriage is not going well or children aren't turning out the way that you had hoped they would or even the loss of a friend or a loved one. We have that natural tendency to want to argue with God. You know, bad times, we, it, it, we tend to think bad things about God. We need to be so careful. So James now uses these examples that all of his Jewish brethren would certainly know and understand. But what I like what James is doing is he's using some real wisdom here because he knows that people don't necessarily relate to theory. I mean, we can throw theory at you. This, this technically is how this is going to work. If this happens and you behave this way, then these will be the results. Rather... He tells real stories about real people, and that brings real comfort. And I don't think anything's changed over the eons, has it? We still relate really well to actual situations, right? When we hear about something that's happened, and, and, and we understand that it's you know, happened to somebody, what, what is the one thing we tend to ask a lot? Is that true? Is that a true story? We want to know that, you know? And even when you sit down on a Friday night to watch a movie somewhere in a theater, you have a whole different attitude if you have this thought that some screenwriter somewhere just made up this story and now we're going to take us on a little journey, great. All right, we'll be entertained. But when that, that word comes up at the beginning based on a true story, we tend to watch it very differently, don't we? We perk up a little bit more. We relate to it somewhat. And we try to put ourselves in the place of that person or those people that are going through those things, whatever it might be. So James is doing the same. Jesus used that constantly, telling those kind of stories that would come alongside those true teachings. So in verse 10, James starts with this of chapter 5. My brethren, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord as an example of suffering in patience. Indeed, we count them blessed who endure. So he starts off by saying, all right, I've encouraged you to be patient, especially in light of the fact that the coming of the Lord is at hand. So even in places of persecution and pressures, when those things around you don't make a lot of sense, be patient. And let me give you an example. Be patient like those prophets of old. The ones who spoke in the name of the Lord. And I love the way he puts it. Here they're doing the right thing. Notice what James is laying out here. These guys were an example of patience and suffering, not for what they did wrong, but for what they were constantly doing right. 
I don't know if you've noticed reading through the Old Testament, especially where you see many of the prophets listed. But when God calls a prophet, very rarely does he call one when everything is going great. Have you noticed that? If a prophet's being called, there's usually there's an indication that something's terribly wrong. And so God needs his mouthpiece. God needs to have that one that would stand in the gap and proclaim, uh, boldly proclaim what his word is and, and steer his people back to the direction of the Lord because they're heading in the wrong way, the wrong direction. So the prophet is sent. So when the prophets of old had that calling, that nudge on their heart, and they began to realize God is calling me as a prophet to the nation. That had to have come with a lot of trepidation, I'm sure, and travail, and even maybe fear, and maybe a lot of arguments back and forth. Lord, are you sure? Jeremiah, I'm so young. How could you use me? Jonah, well, I don't even like the Ninevites. Why should I go up there? You see at times the prophets... Not necessarily, are well, Jonah argued, granted, with God. But even Jeremiah was just saying, Lord, really look at what you're doing here. And are you sure? But once Jeremiah, who's a great example, by the way, of a prophet who endured a lot of perseverance, a lot of persecution, rather. I mean, 50 years this man ministered. He started in his youth. God says, you know, I, I chose you from the womb of your mother. I've already set you aside. I've sanctified you. I'm giving you everything you need to be my mouthpiece. Now go and speak to the nation. But realize they're not going to listen. Know this from the beginning, Jeremiah. They won't want to have anything to do with you. You know, these poor prophets, they wouldn't be liked. They wouldn't be listened to and even not accepted in the mainstream of society. The message that God was giving you would probably be rejected, and you would probably be thought to be insane. You've lost your mind. I'm sure the people that walked by Ezekiel's house on a regular basis thought, okay, this one's lost his nut. He's laying on his side again. He's got some model of the city of Jerusalem with some iron plate or something in front of it. And he's on this side, then he's on that side, and he keeps facing towards it, and he's prophesying against the city. And, you know, you can go any day of the week, and there's Ezekiel in his front yard, laying there. The man's crazy. He's absolutely lost all reason. And yet we know from the book that Ezekiel was being absolutely obedient to the Lord. God calls his people to do some crazy stuff sometimes. And yet, are we willing to be obedient? Are we willing to do exactly what we've been called to do? But I can imagine the life of, of a prophet was a very lonely and isolated life indeed. But even in the uh, New Testament, you know, we see great examples. And Jesus himself even saying and confirming the prophets you know, when he said there in Matthew 5, 17, I, I didn't come to abolish the law and the prophets. In other words, I'm not coming to negate anything that any of those guys said. I want you to know that and understand it right from the beginning. As a matter of fact, I didn't come to abolish. I came to complete. I came to bring all of that to fulfillment. You're going to see in me everything that they were talking about. You're going to see in me every reason why God sent prophets to the nation to steer them back to the Lord because a day was coming when a Savior would indeed come and deliver the nations from their sin and make that way to salvation. Even Paul says in Romans 1 verse 2, which he, God, promised before through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures. So we see some of those examples. Like I said, Jeremiah, 50 years he prophesied, he didn't have a single convert. Not one person that listened to his message. Uh, for him, fortunately, for a young scribe named Baruch who, who sat with him and wrote all of his stuff down, and at least he had a sympathetic ear there. But for the most part, he was rejected. As a matter of fact... Because of his unrelenting faithfulness in preaching God's word, at the end, towards the end of the whole thing, he was cast into an empty water cistern to sink there in the cold mud, at least waist deep in this, 
this muck and mire, this mud, this empty cistern that was just watered enough for him to sink down deep. And there he was left. And he would have starved to death there in that pit had it not been that the Lord nudged the heart of a man named Ebed Melech who then brought 30 and, and lifted him out of that place. That would have been the end of Jeremiah's life. Instead, God spared him, and he was allowed to sit on a hill overlooking the city of Jerusalem. And we see it in the book of Lamentations as the last of the exiles are being carted off to go to Babylon. And he weeps. He mourns. He realizes they never listened. You know, we have prophets like uh, a guy named Micaiah who is rather obscure, but he prophesied along with uh, the time of Elijah there with King Ahab. And he had prophesied against Ahab, saying that the battle was not going to go well for him. And look at what happens to good old uh, Micaiah. Now, Zedekiah, the son of Shinaman, went near and he struck Micaiah on the cheek and said to him, Which way did the Spirit from the Lord go from me to speak to you? So in other words, he's mocking him. And Micaiah said, Indeed, you shall see on that day when you go into an inner chamber to hide. We know that Zedekiah's lot was that he would be killed there. So the king of Israel said, now Ahab speaking, Take Micaiah and return him to Ammon, the govern governor of the city, and to Joash, the king's son, and say this, Thus says the king, Put this fellow in prison and feed him with bread of affliction and water of affliction, until I come in peace. In other words, if I don't return alive, kill him. And until then, just keep him alive, barely. And this was this prophet's lot because he said the right thing. James again encouraging, listen, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord as an example of suffering and patience. Indeed, we count them blessed who endure. And so it was for Moses against the mixed multitude. So it was for David as he ran from Saul. So it was for Elijah as he stood alone on Mount Carmel against the prophets of Baal. So it was for Daniel as he was put by a king who loved him into the lion's den because of a dumb rule that the, the rulers had tricked the king into writing. Persecution left and right. Even in the New Testament we see men like Stephen who while he was in the process of being martyred, and as he's giving that, that, that speech there to those that were listening in Acts 7.52, he says, which, which of the prophets did your fathers not persecute? And they killed those who foretold the coming of the just one, of whom you now have become the betrayers and murderers. As a matter of fact, Paul, as he wrote the book of Hebrews in chapter 11, gave this kind of overview of the prophets of Israel, beginning in verse 35. Women received their dead raised from the life again, and others were tortured, not accepting deliverance, that they might obtain a better resurrection. Still, others had trial of mockings and scourgings, yes, and of chains and imprisonment. They were stoned, they were sawn in two, they were tempted, they were slain by the sword, they wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, tormented, of whom the world was not worthy. They wandered in deserts and mountains and dens and caves of the earth. But the key phrase there is, of whom the world was not worthy. God calls a prophet. I'm sure that the response isn't always a great, yoo -hoo! All right, Lord, if that's what you're calling me to, then we'll move forward. But I'm going to have to move forward in your strength, not mine. So James' point here is that the prophets were persecuted, again, like I said, not for the things they did wrong, but for the things they did right. And that's the example he's trying to set up for us today. In those times that we do right, don't be surprised if hardships still come our way. Guess what? It's okay. God is still on the throne. He hasn't been usurped by the circumstances that we're going through. And he's watching over us. So be patient. And notice that verse 11 says, Indeed, we count them blessed who endure. 
Now that notice that he says blessed and not happy. Indeed, we count them blessed who endure. When you persevere, when you are that example of suffering and patience, then there is an, a blessing that comes from the hand of the Lord, but not necessarily happiness. Happiness is a byproduct. You guys all realize that, right? And we've discussed that before. Happiness depends on something happening, right? Something good has to happen before we could be happy. But blessings are not dependent on any kind of circumstance or anything around us necessarily changing. It's just a, re a realization that God has his hand upon us and that he is pleased with us. So they received that blessing. This blessing that's being talked about, those that endure, those that persevere, it's an unalterable approval and reward of God. An unalterable approval and reward of God. It's like the smile of God is resting upon your life. Isn't that a great way to go through life, no matter what's coming your way? To think that at any moment you could look over your shoulder and see your Heavenly Father there, see your shepherd, your Savior Jesus walking with you, and there's a smile on his face. It's kind of his way of saying, keep going, son. Keep walking, daughter. You're doing good. I'm blessing your life. There's going to be great reward for you. But you keep walking. You keep going. You keep enduring. Because indeed we count them blessed who endure. And that word endure, it also can be translated persevere or having patience through difficult circumstances. Because you know what the fact of the matter is? Our moral development, our character is largely dependent on our experience of suffering. It really is. That's what refines us. That's what puts us into the foundry, if you will, of God's purification. Because otherwise, if we're left to our own devices, every single one of us in some way would drift off. We do, don't we? We really do. And yet, when God brings those times those crucibles in our lives. It changes everything. I've shared with you guys before, I know that I would not be the Christian that I am today if it weren't for those places of deep suffering and trial in my life, of losing a wife, of losing my parents, going through that in a very short period of time. God refined me. He was turning up the fires on that foundry so that that gold that was in that little pot was becoming more and more pure as that dross, those impurities would then come to the surface and he scrapes those off the top and turns the fires up more. And more of those impurities surface and more of that, that dark black dross that, that has no help to the gold whatsoever gets scraped off. And, and you know the principle of the foundry I've shared it with you guys before. The, the, the founder knows that the gold is pure because it's so dull when it has impurities in it. He knows it's pure when he can see his own reflection in the gold. When on that top layer, he does that final bit of dross comes off the top and all of a sudden it just, it becomes like a mirror, like glass, and he can see his own reflection. That's God's purpose in bringing those trials into our lives and bringing those places of suffering, of molding our moral development, of bringing our character into that place of integrity is when he can see his own reflection in our lives, in us. When he can look and say, there I see my son. There's what Jesus died for. That's why I sent him. We are reconciled together, me and this child. You know, troubles promote trust. It brings us nearer to God. It strengthens our communion with God. Those are all great blessings. You know, it's interesting when we say, indeed we count them blessed to endure. And we think, when we hear the word blessed, we automatically think of stuff, don't we? Well, I do. I may be alone on that one. I know you guys are all much more holy than that. So, but I do. I, you know, when I hear the word blessing, I, I have that tendency to always go towards stuff. Oh, yeah, there's going to be stuff involved. It's material. But more often than not, when God desires to bless, it has nothing to do with anything temporal or of this earth. 
It's things like having that nearer relationship with Him, being unhindered in our relationship, strengthening our communion with Him, promoting more and more trust in Him. Romans 8 verse 18 says, For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. Paul had the right perspective. Those sufferings that are here in this present day, they're going to pale in comparison. They're not even worthy to be compared or to be mentioned alongside of those glorious things that are going to be revealed. And notice, revealed in us. Not just something we get to observe, but in our own lives, in our own being, as we are glorified on that great day. So we have those places of blessing. And then the second half of verse 11 says, he gives a second example here. Now you have heard of the perseverance of Job and seen the end intended by the Lord, that the Lord is very compassionate and merciful. The perseverance of Job, you've heard it as being the patience of Job, right? And if you study through the book of Job, you realize there are a few places where he's not necessarily all that patient. But he really shines when those trials first come. I think it'd be worth for us to take just a moment and look at the first chapter of Job together. So why don't you flip back to the book of Job, chapter 1, with me. Since James is using his, him as an example, and he just kind of cursively says, you've heard of the perseverance of Job, and known that end intended by the Lord, but what exactly was that and who is it? Now we've, we know the story of Job, but it's good to get the details once again. So just just read along with me here in chapter 1. Definitely one of the greatest examples of persevering under suffering when you've done right. Verse 1, there was a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job, and that man was blameless and upright, and one who feared God and shunned evil. And seven sons and three daughters were born to him. So he he was blessed with a great family. Also, his possessions were, listen to this, 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen, 500 female donkeys, and a very large household, so that this man was the greatest of all the people of the East. He was wealthy beyond imagination, especially in his day. Verse 5, so it was when the days of feasting had run their course. I'm sorry, I skipped verse 4. Verse 4. And his sons would go and feast in their houses, each on his appointed day, and would send an invite to their three sisters to eat and drink with them. And so it was, when the days of the feasting had run their course, here's the heart of Job towards his kids, that Job would send and sanctify them, and he would rise early in the morning and offer a burnt offering according to the number of all of them. So for all ten kids, he gave a burnt offering for each and every one of them. For Job said, it may be that my sons have sinned and cursed, and God, cursed God in their hearts. And Job did this regularly. So here's Job's heart towards his kids. God blessed him with ten kids, seven sons, three daughters, all of the riches you can possibly imagine. Job was a perfect candidate for being a self-made man. And yet, he completely and utterly depended himself on God. To the point where, when his kids even would have some fun, they'd have a party together. You know, it was the family barbecue. Let's have everybody over, and we're just going to have a good time. And they'd do some feasting. And I'm sure in those days, there probably was some wine involved of some sort. Job at a distance as his kids are off having this feast. When that next day when the feast was done, he would offer up a burnt offering on behalf of every one of those kids just to make sure, just in case that maybe even within their hearts they accidentally cursed God. That in their merriment somehow that might have slipped out. And he covered them, he sanctified them. Well, in verse 6 all the way through verse 12, we're familiar with what happened. Satan approaches the throne of God, and he talks about Job. As a matter of fact, God is the one who first mentions Job. Have you considered him? He's righteous. He's, he's upright in, in all of his ways. He fears God, and he shuns evil. And then Satan challenges the Lord and says, yeah, but that's because you've blessed him. Now, see what Satan, when he uses the word blessed, what is he referring to? Stuff, right? He's not even 
touching on the fact that God blessed Job with a solid relationship with his heavenly father. But instead, Satan's saying, let me go after all of that stuff, and I guarantee you he'll curse you to your face. And God says, okay, go. Now, at this point, has Job done anything wrong? Hello? He hasn't, has he? He's been righteous. God even says of him, he's upright. He fears God. He shuns evil. He's done nothing wrong. And yet God, knowing that Job's righteousness would stick, that his trust in God is sure and had a foundation under it that went far beyond his stuff, gave Satan the permission to go ahead and strike him. And when Satan gets permission, he doesn't mess around. Check out the sequence of this, beginning in verse 13. Now there was a day when his sons and daughters were eating and drinking wine in their oldest brother's house. And a messenger came to Job and said, The oxen were plowing and the donkeys feeding beside them. When the Sabians raided them and took them away, indeed, they have killed, their ser killed the servants with the edge of the sword, and I alone have escaped to tell you. While he was still speaking... So he's getting his words out of his mouth, and down the trail comes running yet another one. And another also came and said, The fire of God fell from heaven and burned up all of the sheep and the servants and consumed them, and I alone have escaped to tell you. He's speaking. Another one comes running up. While he was still speaking, another also came and said, The Chaldeans formed three bands, raided the camels and took them away, yes, and killed the servants with the edge of the sword, and I alone have escaped to tell you. While he was still speaking, another also came and said, Your sons and daughters were eating and drinking wine in their oldest brother's house, and suddenly a great wind came from across the wilderness and struck the four corners of the house, and it fell on the young people, and they, were, and they are dead, and I alone have escaped to tell you. And thankfully, that was the end of it. But what was left? Absolutely everything that Job had and knew was suddenly gone. And look at Job's response. Then Job's, Job arose, tore his robe, shaved his head, and fell to the ground. And what? You can say it. <laughs> Thank you. He worshipped. It doesn't even say that he wept and he howled and he mourned. It says rather that he did all of this external stuff to show his sorrow. He tore his robe. He shaved his head. He fell on the ground. But what came out of his mouth, what came out of his heart was worship. And look at the words that he says. Verse 21. Naked I came from my mother's womb and naked I shall return there. The Lord gave and the Lord take, has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And here's the key. In all this, Job did not sin nor charge God with wrong. Well, that wasn't enough for Satan because he says, well, okay, that's his stuff. So he wasn't all that tied to his wealth. But skin for skin, let me afflict him. Let me take just miserable. And God says, you can afflict him, but do not take his life. And so Satan just goes after Job, and he ends up with these incredible sores all over his body. And look at verse 4 of chapter 2. So Satan answered in the Lord and said, Skin for skin, yes, all that a man has he will give for his life. And then down in verse 8, And Job took for himself a potsherd with which to scrape himself while he sat in the midst of the ash heap. Then his wife said to him, do you still hold fast to your integrity? Now, I want to stop there a second. This was not an isolated incident. Can you tell by her question that this was a bone of contention between these two all along? Do you still hold to this integrity? I think Job's wife was resentful from the beginning that she was married to this man who was probably known as the wealthiest man of the East. But he had more regard for this God that he worshipped. He had more regard for sanctifying his children rather than lavishing gifts on them and on her. You kind of get from just that statement that this was an ongoing thing. This integrity you've been hanging on to your whole life. Wouldn't this be a good time to let go of it, Job, now that you've lost everything? Now that you're sitting there on an ash heap and all you can do is scrape your wounds to gain some relief? 
Curse God and die. That was her conclusion. She was done with it. But here is the absolute key to Job's life in verse 10. He said to her, You speak as one of the foolish women speaks. Shall we indeed accept good from God? And shall we not accept adversity? There's the perspective. There's the trust. In all this, Job did not sin with his lips. So here's the example of Job. And he perseveres. And these three friends come and they sit with him quietly for seven days, which was very, very helpful to Job. Unfortunately, in verse chapter 3, Job begins to speak, which is fine. He probably needs to get some things off his chest. But then his three friends decide to chime in and they just start hammering him. There's got to be sin in your life. There must have been something you've done wrong that all of this is coming upon you, Job. And back and forth they go. And yet Job absolutely perseveres. As a matter of fact, in chapter 19, verses 25 through 27, listen to his words. For I know that my Redeemer lives, and he shall stand at last on the earth. And after my skin is destroyed, I, this I know, that in my flesh I shall see God, whom I shall see for myself, and my eyes shall behold, not, and not another, for my heart yearns within me. And in the very end, as we know, and this is what James is referring to, and you can turn back to James, that not only do we know and understand the person of perseverance of Job, but we've seen the end intended by the Lord. We have the advantage of being able to see the whole story. God intended to bless Job, even materially, more than what he had to begin with. And so he was able to move on in that way. And Job's conclusion there in verse, chapter 42, verse 5, I have heard of you by the hearing of the ear, but now my eyes see you. So James is saying that's the kind of patience we need to have. That's the kind of perseverance that we need to walk in. And then to finish off this small section here that we're looking at, this, this idea of, of patience coming our way, that in suffering we need to be patient in light of the Lord's coming. Above all, verse 12, but above all, my brethren, do not swear either by heaven or by earth or with any other oath, but let your yes be yes and your no, no, lest you fall into judgment. See, our tendency is to make rash decisions and promises when we're under duress. But James is saying, in all things, do what? Tell the truth. Tell the truth. Don't, don't swear either by heaven or by earth or by any other thing. You know, the swear means to take an oath or rather it's to bring God into our circumstances and presenting him and his name as a validity to our commitment. Right? We've committed to something or we've said something and people across the way from us are looking at us like they don't believe us. So we bring God into it. I swear to God it's the truth. I really do. As God is my witness, these things will never happen or this thing will come to pass. I swear by God I'm not lying. And James is saying, don't do that. Of course, he is borrowing from his half-brother Jesus who gave on the, at the Sermon on the Mount there in chapter 5 this very same teaching. Listen to what Jesus says in verse 34 through 37. But I say to you, do not swear at all, neither by heaven, for it is God's throne, nor by earth, for it is his footstool. Nor by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. Nor shall you swear by your head, because you cannot make one hair white or black. But let your yes be yes and your no, no, for whatever is more than these is from the evil one. So be straightforward, speak the truth. You know, James Jewish Christians, the, the, the people that were reading this letter, were caught between both Jewish and Gentile persecutors. There was great pressure for them to deny Christ. There was a lot for them to, to take back their words and their deeds. And frankly, going back on their confession of Jesus would have made life a lot easier. If they would just deny Christ, then they could be out from under all of this stuff. James is saying, don't. Stick to it. Persevere. But don't swear either on heaven or on earth or by any other oath. 
Just let your yes be yes and your no, no. That should be enough, and it will be. God will back it up if you speak the truth. God will back it up. Have you noticed those people that use those phrases are usually the ones that you don't trust anyway? Right? And they seem to have to always do that because they do lie most of the time. They just can't seem to tell the truth. No, I swear to God. Why do you need to do that? Are you so concerned? All right, let's dig a little deeper and see if this really is true. No, in this yes, yes, there is an exhortation to simplicity of speech. Just let your yes be yes and your no, no. I, I like that. We all need to learn to be people of few words, right? Because responding to circumstances with a simple yes or no. You know, no one had to teach us how to lie, did they? It, you don't ever take little Johnny aside when he is two or so and say, I'm going to give you the lying lesson today. I'm going to teach you the proper way to lie. Because if you're going to lie the rest of your life, which probably you are anyway, you want to be good at it. And it takes a lot of work, little Johnny, because once you start lying about something, you have to back it up with all kinds of side stories. And you, you've got to get all of your ducks in a row here. Get your story straight and stick to it, little buddy. I don't think there's a sane parent on earth that would ever take their son through that because somehow he figures it out all on, all on his own, you know? And the world is full of it. I, I heard this statement. She tells enough white lies to ice a cake. Or what about this kind of backwards thinking? A man who will not lie to a woman has very little consideration for her true feelings. I know, it's like you don't know if you should laugh at that or not, huh? A man who, would not, who will not lie to a woman has very little consideration for her feelings. <laughs> so what, we're lying to each other all the time? That's the way we make each other feel better? Well, we do have to be courteous. You can't always say what's on your mind. That's not proper. That's not loving. But lie? You know, advertising is the art, art of making whole lies out of half-truths. And somehow in there, we buy it anyway. But it's kind of like that minister that was walking along the street, and he saw this group of like about a dozen boys around ages 10 to 12, and they were all kind of huddled, and it looked like there was this little dog in the middle. And so he walked over, concerned that maybe they were going to hurt this dog, and he says, what are, you, what are you boys doing? And they said, well, this dog is a stray in the neighborhood. And one of us, we all want him, but only one of us can take him home. So we've decided that we're going to have a contest. Whoever can tell the biggest lie gets to take the dog home. And, of course, the minister right away says, Boys, that's, that's terrible. Don't do that. Why would you do something like that? And he launches into a 10-minute sermon to these boys, starting off with, Boys, you know that lying is a sin, and ending up his message by saying, And, boys, you know, when I was your age, I never lied. And there was this silence among the boys that just kind of stood there for a moment. And the youngest little one looks at the rest of the group and says, all right, I guess he gets the dog. <laughs> well, it kind of convicted that minister quite a bit in that moment. So he decided he would do a little studying on his own. And he talked to his congregation that Sunday and he says, next week, I'm going to do a sermon on lying. And I would like all of you to read ahead. So please read Mark chapter 17 and get pre in preparation for that message. So everyone came back to church the next week. And uh, he said, well, we're going to get ready to do the message here. But before we do, I'd like to ask how many of you fulfilled the reading assignment and read Mark 17. And every hand went up. And the minister said, you know, there's only 16 chapters in Mark. Oh, you guys didn't even know that. Huh? You're sitting there going, well, what was wrong with that? And he said, well, now we'll commence with the message online. Everyone that was sitting there had engaged. It comes very naturally to us, does it not? And yet, when, when it comes through those tough circumstances in life that we face, it's wise to avoid long explanations, to avoid detailed excuses, or even to somehow become pious and try to spiritualize the whole thing. We tend to fall into a trap of making deals with God. You know, we promise all kinds of things if He'll just lighten the load. James is saying, no, just let your yes be yes. You know, there was a time 
not too long ago in our Western culture where we were known as truth tellers. The, the Western culture was known as people that were men and women of their word. That's not the case anymore, is it? I mean, now we purge ourselves on, on witness stands in courts and marriage vows? Are you kidding me? You know, I wonder sometimes if marriage vow, vows were more truthful, what they would sound like. Rather than being this big promise, if we could kind of say, well, this is the retrospect of how this is going to be, it might sound something like this. Um, I hope to do my best to love you. I'm planning at least to make you the only one in my life. I'll try real hard to support you. And when we do have kids, I can't really promise that I'm going to stay to help you raise them. But right now, it looks pretty possible. Do you think that that bride would still be standing there at the altar after that vow? Let your yes be yes, and let your no be no. You know, kids have a, a way around this. I don't even know where that started. They'll look you right in the face and say something, have their hand behind their back. And, the, and, the, and then for some reason it's okay because they had their fingers crossed. I had my fingers crossed. What? Where did that come from? Like this all of a sudden means lying's okay? You can say whatever you want as long as you got your fingers crossed. Nobody's going to know it because you got your hands behind your back. Really, little Johnny? And I didn't even have to teach that to you. You somehow figured that out all on your own. You know, there's nothing wrong with taking an oath. But then your yes needs to be yes. Paul even said in Romans 1 verse 9, For God is my witness whom I serve with my spirit in the gospel of his son, that without ceasing I make mention of you always in my prayers. So he's even in a sense oathing there. Listen, you need to know, Romans, I'm praying for you all the time, constantly. But look at how he turns it around, making request if by some means now at last I find a way in the will of God to come to you. So he was making this oath in a sense, as God is my witness, I pray for you all the time, but it's still completely up to him and by his will that I'll come to see you someday. So let your yes be yes. And the other thing is, Christian, don't embellish the truth either. Stick to what it is. Don't evangelasticize it. <laughs> you know? Oh, there were thousands at the, at the meeting. How many were at the outreach last week? Oh, at least a hundred or so. When indeed there might have been 20. Be honest. Be on Why do we feel like we've got to stretch those numbers? Just be accurate. The Lord will take care of it. He'll bless if only one comes. You know, Jesus died on the cross. If there was only one person on earth, he still would have. If you were the only sinner... He still would have died. And there's rejoicing in heaven when one sinner comes to repentance. So we don't have to pad the numbers, embellish the truth, make ourselves somehow look better. So to finish off, this whole section, verses 7 through 12, how can I do right when I've been wronged? And going through again, this is what James tell us, tells us. Don't focus on the situation or you'll get angry. Instead, be patient. Verses 7 and 8. Don't focus on yourself, or you'll have self-pity. Instead, be strong. Verse 8. Don't focus on someone to blame, or you'll complain or grumble. Instead, view others as a means that God is using to shape your life. Verses 9 through 11. And don't focus on the present, but rather look to the future for insight. And be honest. Verse 12. See, we don't know what's in store the next week, next month, next year. But guess what? God does. He absolutely does. So whatever it is, James' practical advice is be patient. Prop up or strengthen your heart. Don't hold a grudge. And don't scheme to get out from under it. But trust in God. Let me finish with these two scriptures. 2 Corinthians 4, 17 and 18. 
For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, is working for us as far more exceeding an external weight of glory. While we do not look at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen, for the things which are seen are temporary, but the things which are not seen are eternal. And finally, Peter in 1 Peter 1, 6 and 7. In this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while, if need be, you have been grieved by various trials, that the genuineness of your faith, being much more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ. That's the way to live. That's the attitude to have. That's how we move forward in patience, in long-suffering, knowing that God knows what he's doing, taking those examples, the prophets, Job, and then being honest, not letting our circumstances in those places where we have pressure force us or cause us to be dishonest and, and somehow try to wiggle out from under things, but let our yes be yes and our no, no. Well, we are uh, going to have... Uh, afterglow after our service tonight so before we close in prayer i just encourage you guys take some time tonight and over in the fellowship hall you can walk straight across and go in there and spend some time waiting on the lord worshiping together there'll be some brothers over there you may need prayer maybe you want to be anointed with oil for the baptism of the holy spirit and be able to exercise the gifts of the spirit it's a wonderful time so i encourage you to head over there and next sunday evening we're going to celebrate communion together here Sunday evening so plan on being here with us all right Lord Jesus thank you for again taking us through this portion in your word as you inspire James to write that has so much for us and so rich Lord God in both instruction and encouragement so I ask Lord that as we have taken in these verses you would help each and every one of us, to develop a greater trust for you. To be able to think of those examples of those who were called by you, Lord, to do those things that are right, to stand in the gap, to be a voice in the midst of darkness, a light that shines, to speak your words in truth without wavering, with great boldness and confidence even knowing that there would be rejection, that the words would not be heeded, that there would be very little repentance, and yet your prophets were obedient and diligent and stayed the course. And even if they were a little reticent like Jonah, you still got them where they needed to be when you wanted them there. For all of us, Lord, our desire in this day and age is to be that kind of a mouthpiece. For us to be able to say, even as we're sitting here now, Lord, is there something that you want to say to the world around me? To my co-workers, to my family? Is there something that you want to say to the people in my neighborhood? Then here is a mouth, Lord, use it. Lord, is there some kind of work that you want to do to, to bless others, to help maybe those that are in need, then here are a set of hands. Use them. Lord, is there somewhere that you want to go? Some place that you want to bring your word, your light, your love, the message of the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ, then here are a set of legs that will walk wherever you desire for them to. Use us, Lord, in every way. Make that commitment to him tonight. And regardless of what we're facing and what kind of trials we might be in the midst of or what kind of persecution we may face as a result, help us to persevere like Job. Help us to be among those that will be counted as blessed because we endured, because we finished well, because we stayed through it to the end. How tragic it is, Lord, when one of your servants does so well their whole lives and then falters at the very end, just stumbles before the finish line. May that not be the case in our lives. 
Help us to not only carry on the work, but to finish well, to set our sights on that prize, the high calling of God. Strengthen us, Lord. In Jesus' name. Let's all stand.